Yo, Simon Townsend's Wonder World, episode number 347 stroke 2 on XD0076, recorded 8 July 86, transmission date 29786 for Melbourne, Sydney, Brisbane and Adelaide. Welcome to my wonder world. I'm always surprised when I meet adults, people in their 30s and 40s say, who have never been overseas. I think it's incredible because wherever you go in Australia, it's going to cost a lot of money because of the enormous distances to cover. And yet a person can travel to nearby countries for the same or less money. For instance, New Zealand. Now don't let uh, too much of life go by before you make a trip to the land of the long white cloud. Here's reporter Carolyn Mee. the most hair-raising ride of your life. Believe me, I've got too much of it to lie about it. The jet boat was invented in New Zealand by Sir William Hamilton. The boat is revolutionary as it is designed to travel in waters as shallow as 10 centimetres. 360s in the jet boat are a piece of cake or as easy as pie, but I really shouldn't be talking about food at a time like this. Jet boats are found all over New Zealand and are used to conduct tours through the country's many magnificent waterways. Auckland Harbour is probably one of the finest of these water areas and viewing it by jet boat you see sights that not everyone can see. Rangitoto in the background here is one of Auckland's major attractions. It's Auckland's youngest volcano erupting 800 years ago. I hope it doesn't decide to blow its stack now. Auckland Harbour is called the City of Sails because one in five people in Auckland have a yacht. They're seen everywhere. This is West Haven Marina, where the majority of the city's yachts are kept. Harbour is Waitemata Harbour, which in Māori means sparkling waters. A ride on one of these amazing boats costs only $15 for children and $25 for adults. And as you saw, we were completely safe as we all wore life jackets and we were in the hands of a very experienced driver. Thanks a lot, that was fantastic. <laughs> Jet boat, aren't they good fun? Stay with me after this short break for a story about gardeners at a zoo. They need to know just as much about the animals as the plants. What's this? 
Let me tell you, it's a veined helmet orchid. It's a plant. Today's record breaker is Geraldine Deeson Pern, and she says, Simon, I like collecting rubbers, and I have over 300 rubbers in my collection. <laughs> Congratulations, thanks for being our record breaker. For you, the Guinness Book of Records, and take a look at this. <laughs> Amazing. This is the world's biggest ice cream sundae. It's under construction by 50 people, and it weighed 12,293 kilos. I wonder how many people it took to eat it. Right. To be a good gardener is a very difficult job. And some gardeners spend years at college learning horticulture and all sorts of associated subjects. And being a gardener at a zoo requires some special knowledge too. For instance, it wouldn't be any good putting in some plants that uh, gave, say, the itches to giraffes. Now, Wonderworld reporter and animal lover Hugh Munro has this report. I'll plant my own tree and I'll make it grow. In any zoo, the animals must feel at home and to achieve that, it's important to keep them in as close to their natural surroundings as possible. As you can see behind here, the Australian dingoes are quite at home in the Australian bush. Looking for a home in the heart of the country but with foreign animals, that is, animals that aren't natives to Australia, it can be very hard to reconstruct their natural environment. Take the red panda, for instance. They only come from the Himalayas, so the park has had to put in this big European tree here that resembles Himalayan trees to keep the pandas happy. Looking for a home in the heart of the country. The food also needs to be as close to their natural diet as possible. This bamboo is from China for the red pandas. Many of these imported plants are looked after and grown in this greenhouse. And look down here, this is a special type of banana plant which is imported from India for the chimpanzees. A lot of research must be done by the gardeners to find out which plant is right for which animal and also what special attention each plant needs to grow successfully in Australia. As a zoo gardener, do you have very many problems? Not all that many problems, I do have a few. In case of uh, planting certain plants in some enclosures when we're trying to create a piece of art in different habitats. Next morning we come along and find all the plants being destroyed. <laughs> now, what are the other duties of a zoo gardener? Well, for example, the first thing in the morning all the gardeners going to do have to clean the zoo up to make it presentable for when the public comes in. Yeah. And we're trying to make it a little bit of fun by using some natural vegetation for, uh, for using a broom. This is a broom made out of a bracelet honey myrtle. Wouldn't a broom uh, like this they make more mess? <laughs> <laughs> Dropping all of its bits and pieces. Well, not there. really, no. It's very effective. It's been going since the early days of the zoo, since 1916. <laughs> Some exhibits can't have any plants in them at all. That's because the animals just eat or destroy everything that is in there, <laughs> like these naughty spider monkeys. I wanna give me a good night's sleep. There are a wide range of Australian plants here, like eucalyptus trees, such as the Sydney blue gum, which feed most of the Australian animals here at the park, like the koalas. That's why the zookeepers have renamed that tree the koala food tree. Not only have the gardeners made the animals feel at home, they've made me feel at home too. To see the best examples of a zoo gardener's art, just look at the bird cages. The job of a gardener at a zoo. I'll be right back after this short break with a noisy story all about sirens and hooters. What would we do without them? Tree kangaroos are able to walk along branches. They don't have to hop.
The hammer on a hammerhead shark enables it to swim rapidly. Yes, indeed. Not to knock nails in. <laughs> Today's music clip is very interesting. The band is called Heaven 17, and the clip shows them in the business world. But there's someone there, probably from another planet, trying to get their hands on some very important plans. Will the world be safe? Here's Heaven 17 with penthouse and pavement. He's what's called an industrial spy, selling the company's secrets. You may not uh, give it much thought, folks, but uh, sirens and hooters play a big part in your life. I mean, if you didn't have cars blowing horns and school sirens and bells and clangers going off, if ambulances and fire engines didn't make screeching, wailing sounds, how would we all know what was going on? Here now is the unexpected kind of subject that always makes Wonderworld a different kind of program. Your different kind of reporter is Wednesday Kennedy. I suppose none of you people out there have ever really thought about sirens or hooters, what they are, what an important role they play in our society and how they're used. No? Well, you would if you had to listen to them all day. <laughs> a device used to sound warning signals. Ambulances, fire trucks and police cars use sirens to alert traffic. Out of the way. Guys, how important are your sirens to your job? Very important for, for getting from point A to point B mm -hmm. um, with a minimum delay. Fire truck siren has a twin speaker which is made up of a vibrating cone. This has an electrical coil at the back which is connected to the power supply in the amplifier. When the power supply is turned on, it feeds the power through to the electrical coil which causes the cones to vibrate and create noise. How do the Bush Fire Brigade use their sirens? Well, when we get a call from our control centre, which is our base, mm -hmm. uh, they all then tell us if they've got an emergency call from someone that there's a fire somewhere. But using our lights and sirens doesn't mean that we can break all sorts of rules. It's for people to recognise when they hear the siren, they look up and see the light and they move out of our way for us. Next on to Bush Alive, Borrelli Road, Terry Hill, nearest Cross Street, Kinker Road, UBD map reference 15C6. Okay, will do. HQ2 responding. <laughs> A siren is also used by ships or boats to warn other ships away during foggy weather. Now, here's two typical ship sirens. Security sirens can be used in houses and factories. They give off 114 decibels, and you can hear the sound of a security siren at a kilometre away. Now, with all the snatch and grab that happens these days, it's not a bad idea to have a security siren installed into your money-carrying case. So... Inside, you can put your security siren and your wallet, and if you're walking along the road and anybody tries to grab it from you, a siren goes off. To ensure that sirens actually serve their purpose, that is to notify and alert people, it's important that light and sound are incorporated so people can see from what direction the ambulance is coming after they've heard the sound of the siren. Sirens are also used in large factories to indicate when it's time for lunch. <coughs> Lunchtime. Good, that's it. It's a wrap, boys. It's <laughs> time for lunch. No, it's not. It's time for a newshound report. And today's newshound is Joshua Chapman. He reports to me, uh, Simon, I went to Surfers Paradise for a holiday and the best time I had was playing in a huge bowl of coloured balls at an amusement park. It was a really strange feeling, like floating on air. Thanks for the great photo, Joshua. And I've got some great gifts for you. First of all, a toy from... Uh, this is called the Superpowers Collection. It's from Uncle Pete's uh, Toy Warehouse. This one is called the Penguin, and you should have a lot of fun playing with that. And from a company called Peach's Posters. This is a great poster of that great group, doesn't exist anymore, Wham! That's for your bedroom wall. And finally, from the National uh, Safety Council of Australia. It's a game, a fantastic game called Lookout, and it teaches you all about safety while you play the game and have some fun. Right after this break, I'll be back to show you a story about a group of very energetic children who believe to keep fit, you should start young.
Simon loves to reply to your letters, but remember you must also send a second envelope. And the second envelope must have your name and your address on it. And it must have another stamp on it too if you want your photo returned by Simon.